So we've uh, created a simple plinth now, so let's uh, create a bit of text to go on top of it. So let's rename this spline track. So I just have the clip selected, hit return, and I'll call this one plinth. And let's create a new text layer over the top. And I can do either flat text, flat text with 3D lights, or extruded text. I'm just going to go for simple flat text, and we'll just call this one first name, last name. And let's take that size down a lot. So I have the uh, text selected. We can change the font up as well, just as we did previously. Lovely. And the cool thing about the way that the text is handled here is that I can have separate fills for both the first name and the last name. So if I come into the style color here, uh, let's have this one. Actually, we'll keep this one. These, the sort of all, the very light gray. And I'll take this one and make this one a darker, dark gray, almost black. And if I go over to my controls, I don't want to animate this in right now. So I need to remember just to turn off my keyframe. And I can either have the black arrow selected and then just move this into place. Or what I can also do. I could just shift that directly in there just by scrubbing up and down or by typing in a value here. 600, no, not quite. So let's maybe just shift that in there. There we go. And I can turn on, if I go to display, I can turn on title safe right here just to make sure that everything is fitting in nicely within the title safe area. Let's bring that over to the edge. Lovely. Okay. And let's quickly animate that in as well. So we only want this first name, last name to come in once the plinth has finished uh, writing itself on. So in the timeline, I can shorten up this layer by coming in and just dragging that. So we can see, boom, that will just pop in for us here. Now I could animate things on manually. If I come down to my material here and look up at the controls, we have a whole load of stuff that could be animated. So we can animate fill. We've got the fill turned off at the moment because we're using the colors from the texture. So if I turn the fill on here, that would overwrite or overrule the fill that I've done on the texture itself. So we're going to ignore all of these for the time being and just to have a look at type on. And type on is just a simple way of animating on our text here. And all I'm going to do is animate up this one thing, this text type on from zero to 100. And we can decide what we're going to animate. So we want it to come in from the left hand side. We'll have this shifting a little bit here. Let's take that to actually we'll take that to minus 500. And as we animate this, you can see that's building in from the left hand side. I want things to be a, a bit to add a bit of interest to it. I'll also put in a bit of overshoot there. So let's animate this on. Now when animating up, we can actually just add a keyframe or change the type of keyframe directly within the parameter that we're wanting to animate. So I could set a, a linear keyframe here and take that down to zero, for example. And then as I move along here, so long as I don't have another keyframe selected, simply scrubbing in this parameter again will add another keyframe for me. Now, if we turn on the key here, what this does is it sets any new parameters we haven't touched previously. It sets the keyframe there to our default animated keyframe. In this case, it's linear. If we had this turned off, it would set the default keyframe here to constant. So let's just quickly have a look how that works in, in uh, practice. I've got my key turned off. If I scrub in the edge opacity, it's going to set a constant keyframe. See here, set constant. And if I have my keyframe turned on and start playing around with the edge width here, it's going to set a linear interpolated keyframe. Let's come back into type on and just get rid of some of these things here. Okay, back to 15 frames, check that this is still linear. And let's animate this on over 
what's say a second. So bring that into there. Let's play that through. Let's go a bit, a bit too fast for us to see it. So we'll animate it over a bit of a longer time. And before I play this back, it's a good time now to have a look at these other two buttons we've got on the bottom right hand side. So we can toggle the draft mode to high and high end draft. If our UIs begin to slow down a little bit, we can take that to draft mode and see things playing back a bit faster, sacrificing, of course, anti-aliasing and lots of other fun stuff. And we can also see whether our animation is going to be shown as time accurate or frame accurate. With time accurate, as we play this through, check out what's happening down on the timeline here. It's building through not every single frame, but it's skipping a few frames to make sure that the animation is going to play in at the right sort of speed. So we can make a judgment call on the speed. If, on the other hand, we have that set to frame accurate, what it will do is it will go in and it will play through and build up each frame in, in order. So it would actually play through a bit slower. So with time accurate, it might take a few runs through before it renders everything into RAM or caches everything into RAM. And with frame accurate, it will cache everything to RAM as it plays through on the first time, but it will take obviously a bit longer to render each frame forward the first time it plays through. Now I'm quite happy with this little animation. Let's now have everything fading out over the last second. Come over to 415. So we'll twirl our, our first name, last name layer up. We'll go over to composite on the uh, right hand side, set a linear keyframe in our opacity over here, come to the final frame, set the opacity down to zero, and we'll do the same for the plinth. So we'll come over, go to the uh, composite, linear, and set that down to zero as well. So that will all fade out over time. So we're almost there, we just need a couple of small things left. I always like to add a little bit of motion blur onto the titles, especially when they're animating in. So what I can do is go up to my 3D container here, go over to render and go enable motion blur. But we can see as it animates on, we are getting the effect of the motion blur going on. Cool, and before I hit apply on this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my rigid runs. And remember, we saw these rigid runs when we were using the presets. The rigid runs are the things that are going to say, OK, this is where we're finished animating in. So I'm going to go to the, the front here. I'm going to right click on the timeline. And go add rigid run. And then extend that rigid run out now to to the end point when it's finished animating in, which I think was 115. And it was. And I'm going to do the same over here at the end. I'm going to go to the final bit. Just going to go add rigid run there. And that's going to make sure that the timing for the fade out is also going to be the same. So now when I extend out or reduce this clip, it's not going to be affecting the animated bit. That's always going to stay the same. So if I hit apply now, what we'll do is we'll render that effect out and we'll play that back. So we've created our plinth, we've animated the border and the fill separately. We've then also created a text layer and animated that in using type on. Faded the whole thing out, set up our rigid runs, which means that if I now need to go in and change the length of the clip itself, let's make this a little bit shorter. And obviously I have to clear my render as well. But what this will do is it will have preserved my rigid run so that now. Let's drop this down. Drop the quality down a second just so I can scrub through this. So we can see it's preserved my rigid runs. So the animation in. And the animation out. Still remains the same size.